Well, what an amazing uh, service today. You know why we honor our kids and dedicate babies and celebrate graduations? Is because we don't believe that you have to have 14 years of experience as an adult to be significant. We believe that God creates us with significance, and there is no insignificant person in this world. Um, we are in a series called The Dog Days of Summer, and I just want to spend a few moments talking to you about small things. And uh, um, the question was already asked, do you ever feel insignificant? And I, I bet we all do from time to time. We, we feel insignificant. We feel unheard. We feel unimportant. And, and maybe, maybe even um, as this election is coming up, you're going, <laughs> why would I vote? I'm not even sure my vote counts. Uh, why, why would I vote when, when the country talks about politics, you know, and they, and they reference our part of the country? We're, we're called flyover country. We, we don't even matter. Or, or, or maybe you just grew up and, and you were the last in your family and, and everybody else was doing great things and you got to go see all of their football games. You, you, you got to, you had to. And then by the time you came along, there were nobody left to go see your games. That was Noah for us. I mean, he had to go to every one of his brother's games and wrestling matches and this and that and the other thing. And then, you know, his brothers were adults or in college or something like that when he was coming up. And, uh, and, uh, and he didn't have them there for that. But you will know what? In God's kingdom, in God's economy... There is no such thing as an insignificant person. Um, we're going to find that out this morning as, as we read Scripture. We're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture where Samuel in the Old Testament, who is, is we, we have kind of a hard time classifying him. He's either the, the very first prophet or he's the very last of the judges. We're not quite sure how to, how to, how to typify him, but, but Samuel has a tough job. Because there's a king on the throne, his name is Saul, but God has with, withdrawn his hand of protection over Saul, and God has withdrawn his hand of blessing over Saul because Saul has decided he can lead the kingdom without God. And so God said, be my guest. You can lead it without my presence. You can lead it without my strength. You can lead it without my empowerment. You can lead it without my wisdom, and let's see where that gets you. But in God's disappointment, he has, he has given Samuel a task. And he said, Samuel, I want you to go and anoint the next king. And so he tells Samuel, we're going to take you to Bethlehem, uh, to a little town called Bethlehem. And there you're going to find a man named Jesse. And one of his sons is going to be the new king. All right, so let's take a look at this scripture here. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 4. I'd like to read the whole scripture, and then we'll just go, go through it a little bit. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the tr town trembled when they met him. That's going to be really important a little bit later, okay? So they're, they're trembling when he arrives. And he tells them, it's okay, I'm just here for some sacrifices. I brought a, a bull for a sacrifice, and, and I want you to gather people together. We're going to sacrifice. I especially want you to gather Jesse and his sons for the sacrifice. So he's kind of there in an incognito way. He is a super um, spy for God at this moment. Uh, he's got to be quiet, uh, number one, because there's already a king on the throne. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but kings don't do well when someone else anoints another king while they're still on the throne, all right? So Samuel's life uh, is on the line, but then he also doesn't want to be influenced by Jesse's family. He's, God's got the person in mind that's going to be the king, okay? So when they arrived, meaning Jesse's sons, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Would you read this next sentence with me? 
People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen? Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, is this it? These all your sons? All the sons you have? Well, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel then went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Wow. So so an incredible story. How many of you, that's the first time you've ever heard that story? Yeah, a couple of us. So the rest of us, we've heard that story before. There's a couple of things in this story that I want to point out. The very first one is that when Samuel gets to the gates of the city of Bethlehem, um, the elders of the city are, are terrified. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The very first reason is this, and that is that Samuel is an imp- important person. He represents God. He is not the king, and yet the king gets advice from, from Samuel. He is not the king and doesn't have, the, have the, the king's powers, but Samuel stands as judge of the king. Samuel is a powerful person. He is the man of God for Israel. He's the one that hears what God has to say and then tells the people what it is that God has to say. And Samuel has been sent to Bethlehem. Now, I don't know about you, but I think where we're from makes a stamp on us, doesn't it? Being from Lakewood, Colorado, um, that placed its stamp on me, and that stamp says I hate humidity and we'll never get used to it, all right? Uh, But there's like an almost moral or character DNA that we get from where we're from. We, We those of you that are, are from St. Joe know you have some really proud traits from being from St. Joe. And then you also have that other side of you that's just a little bit embarrassed by some things about St. Joe. I've heard you talk about it. You wouldn't ever get up here and testify about it or anything like that. But just say amen if you know what I mean. Amen. All right. So we're in agreement on that. Now, there's some of you that are from the north side and some of you that are from the south side. How many of you grew up on the north side of St. Joe? Anybody here? Yeah. And so you're really proud of that, right? You'll fight for that, right? How many of you are, grew up from, on the south side of St. Joe? Yeah. So these are the people you got to beat up after church. That's, uh, that's all there is to it. One of the things that I noticed when I first came here was that there's this There's this idea that south side people and north side people in St. Joe don't get along all that well. And when I moved here, I thought, I mean, what's the big deal? What what is the big... I even asked a few people what the big deal was, and I thought they were going to fight me. (laughs) All right? If you don't know what the big deal is, then you're one of them. All right? And so so let's just deal with it. But we, we have something inside of us that is tied to where we are from. There's a pride there and an embarrassment there. Bethlehem wasn't a bad place. Bethlehem wasn't a good place. Bethlehem was just a small town. If Bethlehem were between here and St. Louis, it'd be one of those towns that you don't even stop for to get gas. Bethlehem was just one of those places where nothing ever happens in Bethlehem. You know what kind of place I'm talking about? Uh, My dad grew up in Hillsdale, Kansas. You know what happens in Hillsdale, Kansas? Nothing. 
Dogs bite people. That's what happens in, in Hillsdale, Kansas. There are, 400 pe- there are probably 200 people and 400 dogs. That's just the way that it is. Hillsdale, Kansas, it's not known for anything. You've never talked about Hillsdale, Kansas. And you know why you've never talked about Hillsdale, Kansas? Because there's nothing to talk about when you talk about Hillsdale, Kansas, right? Bethlehem is the Hillsdale, Kansas of Israel. At this point, there is just nothing there. There's nothing to talk about. It's a quaint little town. Uh, it's, it's, it's a town where people gather together, but it's mostly rural stuff. There's a lot of sheep herders and, and things like that. Nobody thinks about Bethlehem, except for when God's looking for a king. And when Samuel comes before the town elders... There's a little bit of suspicion that someone so important, someone representing God should come to our town because they all know, everybody knows everybody's business, and they're all thinking, you know, nothing, nobody's done anything stellar, nobody's going to get an award or anything. He must be coming because God's judgment is going to be on Bethlehem. It's, you know what I'm talking about. Anytime you got called to the office out of your class full of people by the principal, everyone assumed that you had done something wrong, right? Am I telling you right? And what did everybody say when you got called out of class? They went, ooh, yeah, that's right. And here are the town elders sitting at the gate of Bethlehem going, ooh, who's in trouble? And Samuel has to tell them, I'm just here for a sacrifice. And I need Jesse's sons to be there. And so they get Jesse's sons there. And I'm thinking Samuel is, is probably going, we're going to Bethlehem to find a king. I mean, nothing comes out of Bethlehem. We have the same kind of mentality. We, we, we think that way. It's, it's been around forever. Remember Nathaniel when he heard that Jesus was from, from Nazareth, said, what good thing can come from Nazareth? You and I think about things like that. We know where the good neighborhoods are and the bad neighborhoods are. Are. We know where you ought to be at night and where you ought to stay away from at night. We know where the God-blessed country is and we know where the God-forsaken country is. The trouble with Bethlehem is that it wasn't any of these. It wasn't a place you thought about. It's overlooked. It's small. It's insignificant. But then... Samuel brings together the people that God has called him to bring together, and he gets Jesse's sons there. And we're told something about Eliab, this very first son, and that is when he walks in the room, immediately something connected with with, uh, the prophet, and Samuel said, that's got to be it. That's got to be the one. Surely before me stands the next king of Israel. There was something about Eliab that stood out. There was something about him that looked presidential. You don't ever make snap judgments about people, do you? I mean, you don't ever stand in line with somebody at the Walmart and take a look at their flip-flops and their PJs that look like they haven't been washed for a while and their sleeveless T-shirt and their messed up hair and their sideways ball cap with just tattoos everywhere and you never make a snap judgment about that person do you if you never make a snap judgment just pat yourself on the back because you you're just a great person and I don't see many people patting each other on the back this morning we make snap judgments about people also many times we talk about these brothers as though as though Samuel Uh, saw the oldest and then worked his way down the line to the youngest. We're not told that in this. We're just told that when Samuel saw Eliab, he thought, there he is. There's the king. This is the guy. But what the scriptures tell us is that at that point, God checked Samuel's heart and says, this one is not it. I've disqualified him as king. Stop looking at his height Stop looking at how together he has it. Stop, stop looking at all the outward stuff and start seeing with my eyes because if I'm going to have a king, they're going to have to have different qualities than looking photogenic and appearing not to drool in public. 
I look at the what? Heart. The heart. You see, we not only carry an assumed identity tied to our geography, we also carry an identity that is tied to our appearance. Many of us grew up probably not being the best looking person in class, not being the most popular in class, not being the biggest in class, not being the fastest in class, not being the smartest in class. And we've been labeled by many, many different names. And if we weren't in that group, then we were in the group that was labeling everybody with those things, right? And we all had labels for each other and we all looked at each other based on appearance. But isn't it funny? How many of those people that are labeled as the smallest in class, the most insignificant in class, and and that kind of thing grow up to do some pretty great things in their lives? One of the worst things that happens is not the labels that other people put on us, but the ones that we put on ourselves. We discount ourselves quite often. Sometimes it has to do with our family of origin. Sometimes it has to do with our circumstances or the trauma that we went through or things like that. But sometimes it just has to do with being a human. We don't feel good about ourselves. We feel insignificant. We feel like I speak and the needle doesn't move. No one listens to me. But God says, don't look at Eliab's appearance. And then he goes down the list of six other brothers, and none of them make the cut. Samuel's thinking, I knew it. We shouldn't have come to this dinky little town with one stoplight, and nobody uses it because everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what time somebody's going to be driving across this weird little town, and everybody's into everybody's business in this weird little town, and I just want to get out of this town and get onto the business of being a prophet. Then he thinks to ask, do you have any more sons? And almost, almost, as if the dad has to go, oh yeah, I've got one more. It must be like the Longleys. Just have enough kids so that you can lose one at Walmart if you need to. You've got several more, (laughs) right? Oh yeah, there's the youngest one, the little one. The last one, the one I didn't think about. He's watching sheep, doing the menial work. Somebody had to watch the farm while we're away. Might as well be him because he'll face important things later in his life when he grows up. This story is so powerful. The story is powerful not because of David. The story is powerful because of what it tells us about God. The story is powerful because even after being a prophet or, or judge or whatever it was that Samuel was for years and years and years and being the man of God, Samuel had some things to learn. He had to learn to look at people with the eyes of God because God needed a king that was connected to the lifeblood of who God was. He didn't need Eliab to be significant. He didn't need the other brothers to be significant. He needed someone who would have his heart and lead his nation his way. Today, I want you to know, we're so caught up in appearances, aren't we? There's even dating apps that all you know about the person is the appearance of the person. we, We are so... We, we judge in our, in our culture so much by appearances and by how somebody looks and what somebody drives and what job they have and that kind of thing. And God says, I need my people to see with brand new eyes. Today, I want you to know that David was an overlooked prospect from a no-account town with not much hope of a future, except that God needed a king. Now listen, I don't want you to think God chose David because he was from a small town. 
I don't want you to think God chose David because he was the last. I don't want you to think that God chose David as king because he was the runt of the litter or because he was working a menial job or because he lived in the country. You know, sometimes we can glorify those things and think that those things set us up good with God. I'm poor, so I'm better than being rich. I, I'm needy, so that's way better than being, you know, some, like some kind of a lawyer or something like that. I, I'm plain looking. That's way better than being dressed up. No, that's not what this is about. You see, God didn't qualify him because he was... an overlooked prospect from a no-account town, but God didn't disqualify him because he was an overlooked prospect from a no-account town. Amen? God doesn't qualify you because you grew up in a hurting family. Doesn't, God doesn't qualify you because you've been overlooked, but God wants you to know he never overlooks you. You see, most of us overlook the overlooked places. Most of us overlook the overlooked people. But when God needs a king, he's not going to overlook the overlooked places and the overlooked people and the unexpected because in God's eyes, there is no one insignificant. What gives us significant is, are we alive to God? What is our heart like? So what it tells us about God is that there is no person so unimportant or small as to be forgotten by God. If you've ever thought about whether God hears your prayers, I want you to know that this morning, God heard, heard the prayers of these little ones that were down here. This morning, God hears your prayers. Um, <laughs> there's, um, it, it is so easy for us who are adults to misunderstand things about our kids. Um, my grandsons visited, and they're from New York. And if you noticed along about Wednesday last week, that just the kind of the frenetic vibe of our town kind of dropped a little bit. That's because they were on a plane out of town um, back to New York. And um, left behind, I think, River, our five-year-old grandson, drew a picture with stick figures, and um, it's blue, so there's obvious water there, and they've been swimming a whole lot. And then there are arms um, of another person um, pushing someone into the water. And so I thought, you know, uh, my first thought was that, <laughs> oh, River's you know, giving us an art display about um, his relationship with his brother. He'd like to be drowning his brother in the pool. And, and then I thought, no, that's not what that is at all. River's depicting somebody being baptized in the water. He's depicting the symbol of new birth in the water. This, this is a really deep picture. River is showing us one of the most powerful and basic icons of our faith, baptism that shows us we've died with Christ and that we've been raised again. I almost overlooked that. How about you? You and I so many times think, you know, man, I'm not qualified to follow Jesus. I'm not qualified for this moment. I'm not qualified for that thing. But let me tell you what, God doesn't care what you think, what Samuel thinks, what anybody in town thinks. If God's got something for you to do, he's called you to do it and he will empower you to do it. Hannah, um, her story takes some twists and turns, and uh, I'm so proud of her. And one of the reasons why I'm proud of her is because there was a moment when she thought she had turned her back on God and that she was no longer useful to God. And I just encouraged her, and some other folks encouraged her. One of the great lady on our district encouraged her, keep listening to the voice of God. Because if God is calling you, not even you get to disqualify you. Um, let me tell you, we discount ourselves more or as much 
as other people discount us, but God does not overlook you. Next thing is this, that God is able to use what is counted as insignificant for great things. Then the last thing is this, um, the last thing is not what I'm going to show you because that's last week's notes uh, that didn't get, dis- that didn't get uh, disconnected. One of the things that I want you to know is that you can also discount the small things in your life as unimportant things. Um, you know those moments where you feel like maybe, maybe I should share with my, my friends going through something tough, maybe I should share something with them about my faith. And then we think, no, 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 this isn't the right time. No, 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 this, uh, this isn't going to make a difference anyway. One of the things that this t- story tells us is that when God is involved, you never know the impact of small moments, of one testimony, of one invitation, uh, of one act of kindness, of one act of compassion. You just never know the power of those things. You know what? All throughout Scripture, God takes the small things and the overlooked things and the forgotten things and the things no one wants to use, and He does powerful, powerful things with them. He takes the small people, the people without power, the people without a voice. And he doesn't choose them because they are without power and without a voice, but he chooses them because God doesn't look on the outside. He looks at the heart. And God uses them in powerful ways. And today, I believe God wants to do that in your life as well. Amen? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Heavenly Father, somebody today feels insignificant. Somebody today feels left out. And I don't know, maybe we train ourselves to believe that. And it's hard to convince ourselves otherwise. But Lord, would you help us to see ourselves through your eyes, that we also might see others through your eyes. Thank you for all that happened in our service today, for a precious baby that was dedicated to you, a mama that said, I want my child to grow up in a home that loves Jesus. Lord, thank you for our kids that were promoted into new grades today. Lord, I think it's important that we celebrate these milestones in our lives. Lord, we thank you for Hannah and and graduation. Thank you for her family that put up with her studying and and, uh, being busy and being distracted. Thank you, Lord, that you've decided to use all these things in a powerful way. And today, Lord, we glorify your name. You're the kingmaker, not us. You're the one that makes things important, not us. You're the one that looks at the heart. Well, we need to be retrained because we only see what is on the outside. May we be more like you today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Just stand with us. We're going to sing. Uh, David's going to close us out with a blessing. And then, just because it's kind of the de facto end of summer, um, we've got popsicles after church, all right? Just, just, just as a dumb little thing to do because summer's over. All right, let's sing with all, all of our heart to God.